Hello and welcome to Beers with Engineers, developing a resilient security strategy. A big thank you to our Beers with Engineers community for your continued support and engagement. We look forward to bringing you today's event brought to you by US Signal and Cohesity. In today's webinar, the first of a two-part series, we will discuss with panelists from US Signal, Cohesity, and Rapid7 the steps you should be taking to protect your critical data against cybersecurity threats and what to do when disaster strikes. Our panel will cover their vision of the market along with current cybersecurity trends, tips for creating an incident response plan, a live incident response tabletop exercise, and more. At the end of today's panel discussion, we will be opening up the floor to our audience. Our panelists are eager uh, Hello and welcome to Beers with Engineers, developing a resilient security strategy. A big thank you to our Beers with Engineers community for your continued support and engagement. We look forward to bringing you today's event brought to you by US Signal and Cohesity. In today's webinar, the first of a two-part series, we will discuss with panelists from US Signal, Cohesity, and Rapid7 the steps you should be taking to protect your critical data against cybersecurity threats and what to do when disaster strikes. Our panel will cover their vision of the market along with current cybersecurity trends, tips for creating an incident response plan, a live incident response tabletop exercise, and more. At the end of today's panel discussion, we will be opening up the floor to our audience. Our panelists are eager uh, to answer your questions, so please save all of those until the very end and we will get to as many as possible. And now I'd like to introduce your panel for today's discussion. Nick Defoe, Director of Information Security at US Signal. Jonathan Mayer, Field Technical Director at Cohesity, Tom McEwen, Executive Consultant at US Signal, and Brandon Force, Channel Solutions Engineer at Rapid7. And I'm your moderator, Katie McCormick, Director of Marketing at US Signal. We are going to start today's panel discussion with our panelist prediction of the market. Nick, are there any emerging cybersecurity trends that our audience should be on the lookout for? Uh, yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll go with an easy one first, um, and I, I don't think I'll be proven wrong. Ransomware isn't going away, so, um, and actually, I, I, I do say that with some seriousness because um, prior to the Ukraine war situation that happened, uh, there were actually some small indicators that Russia was deciding to be a little bit cooperative with the international community in terms of reining in some of the ransomware crews that were operating out of Russia. Um, but since relations between Russia and most of the rest of the world have deteriorated again, um, there's actually been an increase, you know, back up to previous levels and in some cases, um, even higher levels of activity coming out of that country, right? And uh, I was actually at a threat briefing this morning where um, even though the overall numbers of ransomware um, incidents was down from a, a major incident response provider um, for 2022, they're seeing a record high number so far for 2023. So, so ransomware is still out there and uh, may actually be on the upswing again. Um, the other thing that I think is worth mentioning too, because it's another threat that we and our customers face is denial of service attacks, right? So um, again, we've got some conflicting news coming out of that space where overall levels of denial of service attacks have gone down. However, we've had some very specific incidents with some of our customers um, where, you know, they're becoming in the target or in the, the spotlight. Um, and again, surprisingly or not, this relates back to the Russia situation. So back at the end of January, um, many Western countries decided to provide further military aid to Ukraine by uh, essentially granting some latest um, version tanks over to their armed forces. And as a result of that, we had a major bulletin go out from um, you know, top levels of government here in the United States warning healthcare providers specifically that uh, there's a new Russian, pro-Russian hacktivist organization that is specifically aiming at Western healthcare providers 
to retaliate against that, uh, you know, aid that's going to to Ukraine. So that definitely wouldn't have been something that was on my uh, incident uh, security forecast bingo card for 2023, if you will. Not something I would have predicted, but here we are nonetheless. All right. We'll just jump into the next question here. Brandon, um, can you describe to our audience what an incident response plan is and why your organization should have one? Yeah, thanks, Katie. So, you know, at the highest level, um, an incident response plan is going to be a formal document that's going to outline the procedures, steps, um, that, an organi- that an organization should be taking should a data breach or a cyber attack occur. So why it's important, we could spend quite a while probably talking about that. But again, at a high level, uh, it's important on a few different fronts, right? It's going to, at a technical level, it's going to, it's going to enable an organization to quickly detect and respond to an incident, which is going to enable them to ultimately limit the scope of the event, right? It's also important from a business perspective. It's going to ensure that public communication is handled correctly. And then even after an event occurs, it's an important. It's going to um, continue to add value in that it can provide su- support for litigation um, and documentation to show auditors as well. Perfect. Thanks, Brandon. Nick, I have a three-part question here for you in response to that incident response plan overview. Um, Can you provide our audience what should be addressed in that incident response plan, as well as why they need to test them and how often they should be tested? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Brandon queued that up with mentioning a few of the key things already. So, you know, one really important thing to start out with a document like that with is what are the responses? what are the roles and responsibilities of the different people that would be involved in responding to an incident, right? So um, in a lot of incident response policies, you know, vaguely that can be broken down into what is our executive level responsibility? So you could form like an executive response team that gets pulled into incidents and they coordinate at that level. Uh, But then also, you know, who are you going to identify as the incident response coordinator? And this would be the person that's really like the quarterback when you're handling an incident. This is the person who calls the shots and tells the other people that are working at a more tactical level, you go do this now, you do this now, this is what our document says that you need to be doing now. And they basically keep the organization online or on track with the incident response plan as you're working through that incident. And uh, beyond that, you know, you do need those people that are able to make some of those tactical um, movements that are necessary. So whether that's, um, you know, doing some kind of investigation work at a technical level from, you know, the security or log side of it, or even, you know, someone who might be involved in crafting messages to go out to customers, partners, or other parties that may be affected. Um, Somebody might have to call the lawyers and get them lined up to, you know, get uh, advice on what you might be responsible for due diligence wise. So building out the roles and responsibilities is important. Um, Mm -hmm. Generally want to document that with, you know, not this person like Tom is the incident coordinator. It would be somebody that has a role in your business that aligns with that incident coordinator role, right? So the director of information security, which is my title because I had it in my head, is our incident response coordinator. Um, the, the, the role matches up with the incident handling role, if you will. Um, and then beyond that, you know, another important thing to have is some critical contact information, both internally and externally. So you want to make sure that you've got documented how to reach out to anybody who might need to be contacted in the event of an emergency. And that could be, you know, uh, the cell phone numbers of people on your team that need to be reached if there is something you know crazy happening that they need to get pulled into and it again and it was one of those emergency situations but it might also be your insurance provider it might be any managed service providers you use that are critical to how you do business like us signal if you're one of our customers right now um 
law enforcement may also be an important one if you've got contacts with the local police or FBI. Um, and you know, other parties like that may need to get pulled into the loop um, to address certain needs that come up during an incident. A PR firm, again, if you've got a PR firm that you've got a retainer with or a relationship with, you want to have their contact info in there. Um, and, you know, in situations like that, it makes sense to also have the incident response plan uh, printed out in a hard copy. So if you lose access to your whole Microsoft 365 environment, you're not uh, stuck without access to your incident response plan. I actually have you know, one example here, we maintain these red binders in our organization that has a lot of that information documented. Um, beyond critical contact information, um, it's an important step during the process of incident response to be able to identify and classify the incident so you really understand what kind of situation are we stepping into, how severe is it, and that can then guide things like your crisis communications plan. So once you're kind of engaged with an incident, you use your kind of identification and classification guide to say like, okay, this appears to be this level of severity, which means we need to engage these people and then it may require we do this, that, and the other thing. So uh, crisis communications can be one of those things where it, helps you uh, define what should be messaged internally to your organization during an incident. And then if you have obligations to then message externally as well, uh, those things can all be written up in there. And then lastly, but certainly not least, um, are actual playbooks for how to move through the process of handling an incident. And when I say playbooks, this is really like the directions at a high level for what to do when, like in which order. And generally, um, at least my thinking on this is that you should have a generic kind of incident response playbook where you um, generally map to one of the frameworks like Pickerel or like NIST 861 um, with the different stages of incident response. Um, so Pickerel is preparation, identification, containment, eradication, recovery, and lastly, lessons learned. You want to move in a generic way through those steps of an incident, but then beyond the generic incident response plan, you may also need to have specifics. So um, in the case of ransomware, for example, U.S. Signal has a specific plan documented for how we're going to handle a situation like that. We have one also for denial of service attacks because, as mentioned, that's relevant to us in this day and age. It's part of our threat model. Um, other organizations may have to have plans that, you know, are more geared towards application security type of incidents. You know, if you run a critical application that, uh, serves, you know, really important data or really important function or has a lot of valuable information in it, you may have to know how to run instant response around that application and containing a threat to that application. Um, another good one to think about might be insider threat, right? So you've got somebody in your business, inside your business, in your walls, that's doing something that's bad. And how are you going to handle that? Um, that takes a really different approach uh, than, you know, something where somebody's got malware on one of your PCs, right? You've got to bring in different people. You've got to bring in HR. You may have to bring in the police. So it's it's a good idea to try to threat model out what are the most relevant threats to our organization and then build some specific playbooks for those types of scenarios. Uh, so, you know, I think that's that covers a lot of the things that should potentially be included in incident response plans. Um, I'm going to throw it back to the rest of the group to say if there's anything that I missed before I cover the other couple questions that were add-ons to that. Anybody else have things to add there? No, I, th I thought you covered it pretty well. I mean, absolutely. What we, what we experienced when we helped customers work through things is there, there are a lot of things that they didn't 
factor in initially. Like I, I love that you mentioned the PR piece, right? I mean, I can't I can't count how many times I've spoken to customers. Maybe, maybe they're a construction company, and they and they tell me, oh, there's no reason anybody would want to mess with my business, right? I just I just make roads or whatever. It's like, well, yeah, that's pretty impactful if you can't make roads, <laughs> right? You know, so there's a there's a lot of the kind of looking at it from a, a more societal lens and understanding kind of the greater context of you. It may not be an opportunistic attack in these days and age. I mean, you, you may be very much a target. And so kind of know your enemy, understand your own business well enough to, to know those weak spots too, right? And I, I feel like that's the part. So, so many organizations, they look at instant response they're like oh i've got a disaster recovery plan right if a tornado hits we're, we've done this you know last year it worked out great and they don't think about i mean when you mentioned the insider threat that's a very dynamic scenario right you you prepared for checkers and now you're in a chess game and that that's a very different experience yeah thanks for the additional input there um so I think the the follow on questions there were how often should you test and why should you test your incident response plans? Um, you know, I think when it comes to the how often that varies a bit from organization to organization um, because, you know, it, it, it really depends on if you're staffed for this or if you're staffed for that, you know, if you have an internal security team, it looks different than if you don't and you rely on managed service providers to do that stuff for you. Um, you know, I can tell you a little bit about how we handle things here at US Signal just because that's my frame of reference right now, right? So we actually do um, executive level tabletop exercises. I believe uh, at least twice a year. So we generally do a disaster recovery oriented tabletop as well as a you know, cyber incident oriented tabletop. And both of those are examples of you know, how we can get our executive team specifically together to make sure that if we have a scenario come up that you know, is in either of those lanes and it requires you know, us to rally the forces when it comes to you know, an emergency situation, whether it's a, a tornado hitting something like you mentioned, or, you know, ransomware, ultimately, sometimes the impact can be similar, right? Our services are down, we need to communicate with external parties, we need to get the right internal people pulled together. And so it's important for our executive team to be able to do that. And so, so we run those executive focused, you know, strategic uh, exercises, at least a couple times a year. At a more tactical level though, like my team here in the Security Operations Center, uh, we do a different type of tabletop exercise where it is much more um, focused on technical capabilities and specific scenarios around cyber threats, right? So it might be something like, you know, you've got ransomware on an endpoint and what do you do? How do you investigate it? And you do walk through it at that level of, okay, what is my first step? What is my second step? Then, you know, something comes in that's like, oh, well, it turns out this happened as, as the like inject. And we'll talk about, you know, more of that when we get to the, the scenario we're going to discuss. But uh, we do those scenarios, you know, more frequently with my team. And it's, again, at that lower level tactical decision making and investigative process. Um, type focus, right? It's very different than the executive level. Um, and, you know, the reason why we do these things, you know, I already shared that we do them and the frequency we do them, but we do them so that in the heat of the moment, when something is going wrong, we are prepared for it, right? You, you don't want your, you don't want your pilot uh, in the airplane that you're riding in to not have flown a plane before, if you're going up in the air, right? You got to practice so that you know what to do when something is really on the line and a tabletop exercise gives you a safe space to do that. Generally, you want to have, you know, a very um, open set of rules around it where, you know, you've, you don't blame people for mistakes. You don't shame people for saying things that are on their mind you want to have that open collaboration in those tabletops so that you can 
figure it out together um, because you're all playing on the same team and you're trying to make sure that you're ready for a real scenario when it happens. Um, so the guidance is, is always to make those exercises be a very open and uh, clear discussion when it comes to, you know, including people and making sure that everybody's comfortable, you know, talking their mind and saying what should and shouldn't happen at a certain point. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nick. That was a lot of really great information. Um, I know um, Nick just gave us some some great items that should be addressed in an incident response plan. But Brandon, um, do you have any tips for our audience for creating a response plan if they do not have one in place already? Yeah, I mean, Nick has done such a great job discussing a lot of that already, but I'll, I'll chime in with some some more tips here that come to mind. Um, you know, first, I, first thing I'll say is start simple, right? And, and Nick hit on a lot of this, but, you know, identify those contacts, both internal, external. Um, make sure you identify all your appropriate teams. Um, something I don't think we've touched on that I think is also important that you want to do initially, right, is inventory all of your critical business processes, map those to your critical assets, and, you know, determine baselines for those systems. Determine the maximum amount of allowable downtime for those systems, right? Those are all very important things. Um, something else I'd mention is, you know, there's a lot of when you're looking at creating your an initial incident response plan, there's a lot of templates out there we can use, right? And those are great starting points sometimes. Um, if you have cyber insurance, sometimes your cyber insurance provider might have a template you can start with, but also be cautious with that, right? A lot of times they're very generic and know that no two organizations are going to have the same incident response plan. They do need to be very tailored and very specific. So those can be a good way to start um to, to build that plan but make sure you keep that in mind that it needs to be very specific to your organization um something else i'd mention is you know make sure that you're building consensus around this incident response plan that all the stakeholders that are involved are on board that they support it that they're aware of their role um, just that that general consensus is going to be critical in making sure that 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 incident response plan is successful um something else i'd mention is you know remember that this is also going to be a living, breathing document. It's not something you're going to create once and then set and forget. Uh, especially in those first few years, it's going to change a lot, right? In those first maybe three years, you're going to see a lot of change in that document, or at least you should be seeing a lot of change there. So, you know, if you don't necessarily have the dedicated headcount there, which I would say is is can be hu hugely advantageous, um, you know, but maybe that's a contractor or somebody else, right? Maybe they're not an FTE, but um, having some dedicated headcount that can help you think through those high level strategic exercises is extremely valuable there. Um, something else that comes to mind on, on the testing piece, right? I think another way we could break that out is, is also in terms of validation. I think there's testing and there's also validation. Validation meaning, um, you know, ensuring that um, we're validating our log retention policies. We're validating that our clocks are synchronized. Um, we're validating, you know, our, our network and system profiling, again, baselining those systems. Um, so when we look at testing, like make sure we define, you know, what testing means to us. Does it mean tabletop exercises like Nick talked about? Does that mean penetration testing engagements? Does that mean compliance testing? Um, and really break that down, define what testing means, who's going to be responsible for those different pieces of testing and validation. And then you can look at how often you want to do that and who's going to be responsible for those components. Um, yeah, I think those are the big ones that, are, that come to mind. Thanks so much, Brandon. All right, Jonathan, uh, this is a registrant question that I have for you here. Uh, what initial action plan should be undertaken in the event of a crypto ransomware outbreak? What to do and not to do? Yeah, yeah. the initial thing is just don't rush. I mean, speed and, and confidence is, is very important, which is you know, a lot of the stuff that yeah, everybody's spoken about so far. Uh, I think Brandon really touched on something that I, I mean I've I've encountered where companies may not truly understand their business critical functions. You know they think they do, but then when they get into the the scenario, they realize that they they had a there was a gap, and as a result, that has a drastic impact on what that recovery process looks like. You know they they think they've got a viable backup, or they 
you know, they think they can operate on paper for a certain amount of time, but they, that turns out to be false. So um, what I mean by don't rush is that it's, man, that's a, that's a very startling thing when people who are not used to working with this stuff, you know, coming to do their jobs and all of a sudden their screen's red. And I mean, the, the messages are intended to be menacing and, and, and invoke a lot of emotion. And so it, it's, it's pretty common. Like they, they want you to start clicking on things and doing things and, you know, start engaging with the customer support so that you can process the Bitcoin and, you know, be rash. Or I, I've seen it the other way around where, you know, somebody says, oh, well, we've got this, you know, great backup. We can throw things back in place, lickety split. And so they push a button, but they they didn't actually identify and classify what they were working with. And they, did, they didn't isolate the threat. And so they recover everything only to have it encrypted again within 30 minutes, right? So, you know, it's it's really do the homework ahead of time so that you understand both your business and you know you, you're able to step through those specific response plans that are geared towards the encryption type events and then don't skip steps like make sure that you actually go through it because you you have time and i mean that's the thing is a lot of people don't realize or they don't in that moment they're not thinking if somebody's trying to to ransom you that's a business. And so there, there's a return on investment. There's a total cost of ownership. I mean, just just like all the legitimate businesses, they, they think about how they operate. The, the ransomware gangs are no different. And so ultimately they, they want your payment. And so they're gonna extend you a little bit of patience. So take advantage of that. Great, thanks, Jonathan. All right, I have two more questions for our panelists. The next one, I'm hoping everyone can kind of chime in and provide their feedback here. Um, what is the easiest to implement but most valuable security practice and process? This is another registrant question coming to you guys. I feel like when we did the, the run through, MFA is just the unanimous, you know, check the box and then go from there. It seems overly simplistic, but it's effective. Yep, MFA, um, password managers, that's another one, right? Extremely easy and simple, but immensely important. So uh, I would add in there, you know, a strong password policy to start with. Um, you know, before coming to US Signal, I worked as a penetration tester for a number of years. And uh, there's a lot of orgs that are still comfortable running, you know, the defaults with eight characters or little complexity required. Um, any penetration testing firm out there with their salt nowadays is recommending, you know, a minimum of 15, 16 characters. And with good reason, right, those those passwords are a lot stronger for a lot of technical reasons, not just the length and complexity. Uh, there's back end reasons with the Microsoft stack for why they're better too. So uh, MFA is great. MFA plus a strong password is even better. Yeah, I, I think some additional add-ons to that, right, is, you know, besides the password and having a strong password policy, what we see a lot of, uh, right, is people taking advantage of is social engineering engagements, right? Companies tend to lack on training their staff enough in, in social engineering and not clicking on things. That usually is where most people, at least in the SMB space, tend to get themselves in the trouble, especially where you have um, seasonal staffing where folks are coming in, right? And they have elevated privileges, but they've not been onboarded enough. So, you know, looking at your program in that regard, and then also your patch management practices, right? That's the other side of it, where we see a lot of, you know, past incidents that were reported, especially some of the bigger named ones where not knowing their vulnerability estate and taking care of things from a practice standpoint, really kind of come into like rounding out, you know, security approaches, security practices. You know, we had some good feedback on validation steps. Those are table stakes, right, of, of being able to conduct those things. Thanks. Moving on to the very final question here before we move into the incident response tabletop. Nick and Tom, could you please provide our audience with tips for proactively protecting data against cybersecurity threats? 
Here, I'll uh, I'll start, and then Nick can follow on. So from from a tactical level, right, some of the things that we need to ensure, right, we talked about having a robust security program, and we know a lot of folks tend to lock in in that regard, whether it's executive attention or budget to provide the tooling. So, you know, at a base level for protecting your data, having solid backups, um, having immutable backups is table stakes today in the game, right? And then, you know, moving up the stack from a tactical level is having visibility and telemetry to understand when you might be coming under attack or if an attack has happened. You know, that's key and critical right, from a services perspective to have visibility and insight. And then moving up from from there, right, it's additionally having a good vulnerability practice and then moving into um, having the appropriate security tooling, MFA, um, whether you have a solid uh, EDR approach or EDR with XDR paired with it, right, to help as preventive measures um, and then relying on partners uh, where you have an organization that might not be able to afford having robust security teams um, or you just have tooling overload where you don't have the appropriate time to either properly tune or address those. It's looking to partners who you know assist and address those gaps. And then the last piece is going back to like tabletop exercises. What we tend to see um, when events that come up Right is the sometimes these are formal or compliant organizations that get hit right that should have or may have robust practices but they still get taken advantage of and so you know thoughtfully just looking at your um, risk assessments a little bit more proactively and then running through those with your tabletop exercises just to ensure that you have your gaps covered right and so. Um, What I mean by that, right, is if we take the DDoS example um, and then kind of go through um, the step of um, I might be coming under a DDoS attack. And if you're going out to your vendors and looking at where you have your current DDoS services in place, right, then that's obviously a gap. You should probably already have that checkbox understood. Um, If not, it's an awareness, right, that you should probably go out and do that. And if you have websites um, being covered, kind of understanding your estate there for for websites and services, right? Where they're publicly housed, housed, what's available um, for those. So um, I think that's a good good stepping stone there, right? Is uh, web and security services would be the layered add-on, right? For, you know, some level of DDoS protection. Not pause, I'll let let Nick kind of chime in. Yeah, thanks, Tom. You did did a great job covering, you know, a lot of the ground that, you know, we get you a signal partner with providers like Rapid7 and Cohesity to, you know, protect our customers in a lot of those ways, right? Um, customers that are looking to get more on top of their security game. Um, so, you know, I'll give you a couple, I'll give the audience a couple of uh, more freebies that they should be thinking about and going for themselves too. So, Um, Two other things to consider. Um, One would be, you know, really taking a close look at the privileged access in your environment and trying to scope your privileges down to a least privileged model where um, you don't necessarily give everybody the same access to everything in your network, right? Or your network or your file server or whatever that looks like. Um, Because, you know, if somebody if an attacker lands a payload on one of your workstations and that person just doesn't have access to your sensitive data, that's better than, uh, you know, them getting straight in and having, you know, wide open playing field from there. Um, Thinking about things like that, you know, not just from the critical data, but even like, does everybody in our environment need to have access to our VPN? Well, in a situation like Tom mentioned, where you've got seasonal workers that come in for a part of the year and they're not really all that onboarded to your systems, their account just shouldn't have uh, the ability to auth to your VPN. They probably don't even have a laptop that they take home with them at that point, right? Uh, so why should the account have access to the VPN? We see, we've see we seen 
or I have seen stuff like that on penetration tests where it would just be so easy to put the people that need it into that, you know, security group and active directory and leave everybody else out because they don't need it. Um, second thing to think about and just consider is, um, you know, is your network flat and can you do more to isolate your critical systems from that perspective, right? So not everybody that is on your network needs to be able to talk directly to your finance server. Not everybody that's on your network needs direct access to your, uh, you know, like HR file share, things like that. Um, and if you can isolate those systems down, um, another great example from just this week, you know, there was a major vulnerability that came out in Cisco, like hardware phones, a 9.8 CVSS critical vulnerability in Cisco phones. Well, your Cisco phones really don't need to talk to everything else on your network. So please try to isolate them to a dedicated VoIP network or something like that. So they only uh, can talk to what they need to and only things that need to talk to them can talk to them. Um, that type of, you know, risk mitigation by just closing pathways, closing off attack pathways can really go a long way when it comes to, you know, dealing with a penetration tester or an adversary at the end of the day. So uh, those are those are a couple things that come to mind when we're talking about reducing your risk in a, a few achievable ways, I think. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Tom and Nick, for that answer. All right, so jumping into our incident response tabletop exercise, as we've learned through the panel discussion that an incident response plan is only useful if it's properly established and followed by your employees. So to help staff, we suggest regularly testing their reactions through tabletop exercises. So for the purpose of this exercise, it is recommended that the following roles are included in your tabletop incident response. IT manager, marketing manager, VP of sales, VP of operation, and exercise leader. For the purpose of this exercise, we are simulating a team that works for a small manufacturer with 350 staff, creating widgets that are used during light manufacturing processes out of three facilities in the Midwest. One Friday afternoon, the VP of sales calls your IT manager to tell him that a distributor of your products got a phishing email from your company. While the IT manager is still on the phone, a help desk employee walks into the office with something urgent. An additional report of a phishing email has come in via support channels. The emails both came from one of your top salespeople. How do we begin to investigate the issue? Yeah, so, I mean, we're understaffed, right? There, there are tools uh, you know, out there available for this, but we're a small company, so we, we haven't ever, you know, justified the cost of those things. I mean, at a bare minimum, you know, see if, see if you can go in and just disable that account, right? Stop the bleeding. And one, once you have things, you, you, want, you want to try to minimize movement so then you can start figuring out uh, what you can work with. And that this is also a great example of, maybe this is the first gap that, you know, you've determined in your own environment. Yeah, I mean, so lacking, you know, real security tools doesn't mean you have nothing necessarily because, you know, most of our customers are on either a G Suite or a Microsoft 365, right? So um, I think where I would probably start is hopping into that 365 and trying to run a message trace from the account that has appeared in those phishing messages. Um, can we actually see what's going on in that situation? Um, because, you know, we've got a couple emails that were reported. Our help desk guy says that it looks like a, um, you know, actual message that came from the account. It doesn't necessarily look like it's spoofed. We got to go see if the message actually came from him, right? You could also look in, you know, start looking in Active Directory, look at uh, failed authentication attempts, look at authentication, you know, locations, um, authentication times, right? Those can help us. Um, also, a lot of uh, we can probably get a lot of information in this kind of identification phase of our incident response simply from talking to that that particular you know sales rep who's sending the emails, right? Um, in terms of determining the method of compromise, you know, did you receive a suspicious email? 
Um, did you download new software recently? Um, have you, you know, entered your credentials anywhere after you clicked on a link? Have you opened any new documents? Um, you know, anything weird going on in your workstation, right? We don't even need any tools to, to, to ask those questions. Yeah, how many days a week do you work at an unsecured Wi-Fi at Starbucks? From Russia. <laughs> well, that probably wasn't you. <laughs> and at what point would the IT manager notify other people in the company about the situation? Well, like Nick was just talking about, right? You know, as, as you get more information, then that's that's where you have better understanding of what the next steps are. So, you know, let, let's say uh, you do go in, you do some traces. It is legitimate. These are coming from his account. Um, you know, may, maybe in that process, you actually go look in his mailbox. You're, you're an admin, right? So you look in his mailbox and you see that there are more messages going out. So, or that went out. Uh, so now that's a great time to start letting, you know, th this is not a situation where staying quiet is going to make it better. I, I think you also might identify, you might notify different people at different time periods, right? Like as, as soon as we verify that those are emails that are going out from one of our sales representatives to prospects and customers, we probably want to notify sales leadership so that they can start thinking through how they want to communicate with those prospects and customers. We might wait a little bit longer once we have a better idea of the scope of the event um, and you know maybe how it got started before we take this up to executive leadership so we have something uh, to present to them, right? So I think we're gonna present different information to different people and it might be at different times as well. Yeah, I like, I like how you looped in the uh, actual employee whose mailbox it was, you know, really early on, because that would be something you might want to even do that before you uh, pull up the message trace. You know, my, my thinking is always got to look at the logs and see what the logs say, but it's just as important to follow up with that person and say, like, did you see anything weird? And, uh, you know, having had some situations like that in the past, there's some chance they're going to say yes, but there's also a big chance they're going to say no because they just didn't realize whatever happened happened to them, right? But you got to ask the question because it really can help uh, shortcut a lot of other things if you if you do get the answer that uh, is helpful, basically. Yeah, you could really expedite the process with a 30-second phone call potentially, right? If the user says, I was out all week on PTO and I haven't logged into anything, you know, you immediately know that that gives you a lot of context immediately. What tools do we have in place to investigate the issue? Yeah, just just keep that dialogue open. Like like you said, anything you can, any any information you can glean from people as opposed to having to dig through logs, it's going to just speed things up and help you be on, on target. And beyond, uh, you know, looking at a mail trace from like Exchange Online or, or Google Apps, if you've got it, um, we'll, we'll pretend we're a Microsoft shop here because that's the majority of what we see out there with our customers, right? So uh, with Microsoft environment, looking at Azure Active Directory directly as opposed to just Microsoft Exchange Online uh, can be helpful because there's some information there that doesn't appear in some of the other, you know, control panels that you've got. Um, the other thing you'd want to look into in an account takeover type scenario like this, where a potential account takeover scenario is your antivirus, right? You probably have some kind of endpoint protection, even if it's just the basic Windows Defender, and that could have some kind of information that could help. I was just gonna say also, you know, consider consider quarantining their workstations and their, you know, their laptop immediately before you even do that, right? Yeah. Um, worst case scenario, they're they're locked out of their laptop for a couple hours while you figure things out. So you but you're ensuring that you can stop the bleeding. Disabling the account and quarantining the workstation is certainly a good idea if you get to this level of uh, discovered, you know, email going out, that sort of thing. And actually almost forgot to mention with Microsoft. Revoking the sessions is also kind of necessary. You can't just change the password or disable the account without revoking the sessions too, because then an active, you know, uh, connection can still be used. The next question that we have, it which we've kind of already answered, would your internal team be able to conduct the investigation, or would we need outside help? 
Yeah, I think that's actually a hard one for us to answer, pretending to be another company right now. <laughs> Uh, yeah, because I can tell you I would be able to, but, uh, you know, I, I think um, even beyond the, the tooling that we've talked about, there's other ways that you can forensically investigate an issue like this that doesn't require having paid tooling in place ahead of time, right? So uh, there's a really great tool called Chainsaw that you can use to analyze logs from a Windows workstation. Um, and so if you're aware of that, and you're willing to go to that level to really understand, you know, I'm going to analyze the logs here and chew through and see if I can find a, an indicator of compromise, you know, y you can go for it, right? But not every org is going to be aware of that or know where to, to go next. There's, there's other examples where you can use some uh, forensic grade tooling that, for example, like CISA has put out to investigate Microsoft 365 tenants to pull down indicators from them. Um, I think it's like a, a PowerShell script that they've built. And that can do things like look at all of your accounts and see if there's malicious forwarding rules that have been created in those accounts. And in a situation like this, that might be another, you know, real smoking gun that something bad happened to this person's account. But, uh, breaking character here, you know, don't don't know if every org is going to know about those things or be comfortable trying to make it happen, or if you're going to need to engage a partner to help figure it out, um, who who is more versed in the incident response kind of processes that are required to do endpoint investigation or, you know, cloud account compromise investigations. Anybody else have thoughts on that otherwise? I was just going to say, I mean, Nick brings up a great point where I mean, if, especially if you are in a, a smaller operation like the, the simulation here, uh, this is the perfect time to figure out, oh, wait, you know, I'm going to call for help and maybe maybe consult with somebody uh, like your signal ahead of an incident to to learn about those tools. Right. And so I guess I just broke character as well. So but yeah, I mean, that, that's the whole whole idea, right, is now, now we can learn about that stuff proactively, and, and it is part of our actual response plan when it matters. I was just going to add, I, you know, I think this is this is definitely the value of these tabletop exercises, why they're so important to conduct, right, because it's going to shed light on uh, on where your gaps are, when you need to call people, but also, you know, that, that identification process we just talked about a lot uh, previously in that, with that last question. I think before you can answer that, uh, this question, like it's it's why it's really critical to to determine, you know, where uh, what was the initial point of compromise, what is the scope of the compromise, because um, that's gonna that's gonna affect you know the the support you need hugely. Oh yeah, for sure. And then you know, in the scenario here too, even you know, does the compromise even extend beyond your own four walls? So you know, if sales staff have been compromised, right, more than likely. Emails have been sent out to um, contacts, could be customers, could be distributors, could be prospects, right? And, and it's formulating a good, you know, sound plan of identifying what that impact is going to look like because then, you know, it leads into kind of what we alluded to, right, is communication plans, um, not just how I investigate and contain, but how do I also um, try to go out and, and protect my reputation a little bit, right, with my my customer base, my prospect base, and notifying them and, and actions that they need to take it, you know, care of. Wonderful. That brings us to our first injection. After investigating the salesperson's inbox and the corporate Microsoft 365 account, you can see that many emails were sent from this account over the past four days, totaling over 900 to both existing and pro existing customers and prospects. The IT manager reaches out to the user whose account sent the messages and they are unaware of anything unusual. Our first discussion question is what would be the next steps after learning this? I think we hit on a few of the next steps already in terms of yeah. you know basic containment, but we can definitely dive deeper because we didn't go into everything, right? Um, you know, certainly disabling the user's account, um, you know, quarantining those assets. Um, some other steps we might take is, you know, uh, is MFA enabled anywhere possible? Enable that. 
um, reset passwords, look for suspicious forwarding addresses in the user's accounts, inbox forwarding rules within there. Um, I think, think Nick mentioned run an AV scan on 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 those that user's assets, right? That's going to be important. Um, maybe we want we've only got 300 employees. Maybe we want to do a an AV kick off a scan organization wide, right? Yeah, those are some initial ones that come to mind for me. Sorry, it was mentioned earlier. I mean, this is sales, right? Uh, or is a salesperson, and you got to assume 900 of those. That's a lot of customer impact. And so at this point, sales leadership, we, we talked about maybe they should be involved earlier. They should definitely be involved now because th that's that's going to have yep. a widespread impact. And legal yep. counsel. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, legal counsel, sales leadership, um, maybe even going to the point of with that many emails, right? Um, depending upon where it's at is also even potentially quarantining, you know, your tenant for, for outbound email. Uh, as a stopgap, you know, initially. So there's definitely a number of things that that could be done. And then obviously here, like I alluded to earlier, right, jumping a little bit ahead, but kind of getting into the communication plan and then, you know, worrying about marketing communication and reputational brand impact for for the organization. Yeah, when I when I uh, look at this, you know, the discovery that the email count is so high. Um, that's definitely when I would kick from kind of that initial identification phase into that containment phase if I hadn't already, right? Because this is not just a couple emails, this is hundreds of emails to our customers. And so, you know, I'd probably be flipping all the switches I could to try to stop whatever is happening from continuing to happen. But beyond that, you know, like, like everybody else has mentioned, it's time to really spin up the full incident response process in terms of getting executives involved, getting, you know, communications involved, you know, anybody else that might be required to handle this as an organization needs to be at the table at this point. So I, that kind of does cover our next question, I guess. But, uh, you know, when, when you're moving into that containment phase, that's when you also want to make sure you're pulling in all the resources you need to actually do what you need to do. Thanks so much. So since we had already answered the the next question, we're going to kind of jump ahead here. Can you determine how the emails got sent from this account? I think that, again, kind of goes to the, the question of, you know, this hypothetical company and their skill level, right? So we can't really answer that in a, a genuine way. But, you know, if you were able to look at the Microsoft uh, Azure AD logs, it would probably be a pretty good indication if there was some kind of login for that user's account that doesn't match up with where the user has been for the past, uh, you know, week or whatever the time frame is where this incident has happened. You know, if we're seeing... Um, if we're seeing, you know, he's just been in our regional city area for the past week and there's all of a sudden a login from Azure AD that comes from somewhere else in the United States even, that's a pretty strong indicator that somebody has gained access to the account. So that's probably the most likely thing that would come up in a scenario like this and the most easy way that you could identify it, you know, for lack of other tooling in place ahead of time. You guys might have other ideas than me, though. That was actually the direction I was thinking. Perfect. And then the next question is probably very similar um, to that, where what more would you do to investigate the account in question? At this point, I mean, I've, I've actually gotten these calls from people where it's, you know, it's just a five person business and they say, hey, bad things are going on. What, what would you do? Right. And at that point, I say, take that laptop, turn it off find somebody that can really tear it apart and, and get real help or bring in you know uh outside assistance at that point is about what more you can do at this point right because we're a limited company limited capabilities and limited on tooling right and then as you know follow on it, it's opportunity to, to investigate also like as you're going through this exercise right is also documenting where my my gaps are going to be, right? Because the next step is is how to prevent this from happening again, you know, tomorrow. Exactly. What 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 parts of this process took were very time consuming? Where did you fumble? Um, yeah, document all those things so that it doesn't happen again. You can put the proper tooling in place to help you next time. You have the right people on standby to to call when when should this happen again. The other thing that 
is worth mentioning, and I don't think it's come up at all during uh, even the previous discussion to the tabletop yet, is, you know, if you if you do have an incident like this that does have a fair amount of impact, right, and this does have the potential to impact your brand in a negative way, chances are at some point you're going to want to loop in the lawyers and also potentially your insurance provider, right? And that may come into play whether or not you actually have cyber insurance you probably want to talk to your insurance provider and in some situations what they will do is actually assign you a breach coach or a actually hire an incident response firm to work on your behalf to help you resolve this issue and you know if your organization doesn't have the internal expertise to to continue with an investigation like this and your insurance provider is in the loop, they may figure that part out for you and bring in somebody who can do that work, you know, do the the forensics where possible on that cloud account, identify what caused the issue and so on and so forth. Can't always rely on it, especially if you don't have a dedicated cyber policy, but that can be a thing. If you don't have a strong incident response plan of your own, you may get one enforced upon you by somebody else, depending on the situation. Great. Thank you, guys. This brings us to our next and final injection. The owner of the company has dropped in while you are working on finding more information and says that they have a call from a good friend who also got the malicious email he has made it clear that he expects the company to resolve the issue quickly. So our final discussion question is, which steps should be taken to resolve the issue from the perspective of your organization? I mean, this is where pretty much a new one every every week or two. Uh, communication is such a huge part of this. As, as soon as one of these incidents goes outside your company walls, you have to communicate quickly and e- effectively. And failure to do that that could be pretty catastrophic. People want the truth. And I mean, there's kind of two two schools of thought, right? One is you just say, hey, we don't know how bad it could be. It could be really bad. And that way you deal with a lot of backlash right up front. But as you get more information, it doesn't, it, you, you've pretty much set the table as bad as it can get. And so at that point, you can only provide good information uh, or you can play it coy uh, there, there are some password managers that did this more recently. Uh, it did not turn out well for them. <laughs> where, you know, you say, oh, yeah, it's, it was it was just one employee, no big deal, right? And then as you find out more and more and more, it gets to be a bigger and bigger deal. So I'd, I'd say that that's definitely where, you know, that's not my pay grade. That's why we have lawyers. Um, you know, let, let other people make those those statements, but make statements quickly. Well, this is, you know, that's part of kind of a, a broader thing we, we talked a little bit about earlier is like really uh, the goal of, and it's important to remember the goal of security is, you know, kind of counterintuitive. It's not security, it's risk reduction, right? So we need to identify what is the risk of not communicating this event? Um, and, you know, are we willing to or, or how, how are we going to communicate this, right? It's, it's all about identifying that risk, prioritizing it, and then coming up with the proper response. Um, and communication is a part of that as well. Really uh, good point there. And um, I hate to keep pointing the finger at the lawyers, but in a lot of cases, lawyers may be necessary because they can tell you in certain situations, well, you may have a legal obligation to disclose this situation. You may have to provide notice. You may have to report it to a regulatory agency as a result of you know, what type of business you are. A manufacturer making widgets, I certainly can't tell you if that applies or not here. Um, but, but you would want to have a good idea of that you know, while running through your own incident response tabletops and your own incident response planning, um, you want to at least know who you can talk to to figure out what those obligations are that your company might have. But, you know, I guess going back to the the latter stages of the uh, Pickerel framework, if you will, right? So, like, we've done we've done containment, we've kind of identified the scope potentially of our issue here. Um, Next steps would be eradication and recovery, right? So if we're confident maybe that this was limited to a single account that was compromised, 
and we've already disabled the account, the next step might be rotating that user's password, potentially wiping their laptop or something like that. If we're not going to go down a forensic analysis kind of path to take it to court or get some real evidence, you know, you can you can potentially wipe that laptop and re-image it if you think there's some kind of infection on there. Um, and then, you know, the recovery side of it is really like, how are we going to message, like you guys talked about, how are we going to message this out in such a way that protects us, but also um, isn't so coy, like you said, that we're, we're providing, you know, no real uh, information and potentially contributing to like the FUD that's out there around our organization by not being forthright about what the situation is. I think another important part of that recovery phase is also, you know, go out, um, set alerts, right? Continue to monitor for for more activity that is related to this event. So, uh, cause you know, that potential is always there, right? And that concludes today's panel discussion. Make sure to stick around as we go live for a live Q and A with all of our panelists today and submit your questions below. All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are going to move into the Q&A portion of today's Beers with Engineers event. I have all of our panelists here. Go ahead and submit your questions um, using the um, tab that's likely on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, it will look like a question mark, and that's where you can ask all of our panelists questions. Um, we do have uh, two questions submitted. Um, that we'll kind of jump into. But before we get started, the question I'm sure that everyone is wondering, our panelists that have drinks with them today, what are you guys drinking? Share with our, our group today. I grabbed a Lone Pint Yellow Rose <laughs> IPA. So uh, I went uh, security nerd on this. My beer is called, uh, or is from Black uh, Project, which is out in Denver, but it's called Cypher. <laughs> there you go. I, I'm in I Denver, can't get some so Coors Light for me. <laughs> I'm in Denver, so I might have to grab that one next time, Nick, but uh, my beer stash is running low, so I'm drinking a Fresca today, unfortunately. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, I just have water here, gearing up for uh, Founders in the next few minutes. I'm um, sure everyone's getting excited to head over to um, Sun King and Founders for our networking happy hour, so we'll jump right into the questions. Um, just a couple of them so far. Um, so I'll ask the group here, what are the most prevalent and under-considered security risks present in many ISP networks? That's a very specific question. And <laughs> I don't know that I actually want to answer it. <laughs> um, uh, this may be a cop out, but I'm gonna say it, I'm gonna say that this way anyway. You know, blind spots happen in any network, right? And uh, not knowing what you've got out there and uh, having good monitoring set up for those things that you you have present is something you struggle with, you know, no matter what type of organization you are and what type of network you're running. And so, you know, having an accurate inventory and making sure that you're monitoring the things that uh, you've got are some critical components, I would say, for sure. Yeah, right. absolutely. I, I used to joke and say that 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 whole art of finding all the weird stuff in the corners of the network is network archaeology. Absolutely. And I mean, especially with ISP networks, um, you know, there's a tendency to have things that, um, you know, in, in telecom specifically have been around for a long time just because the organizations tend to be a little bit older um, and in some cases you know there's really old technology that is still serving critical functions at the core of those networks because again sometimes older tech older organizations mm -hmm. uh, archaeology is an apt uh, description there in some cases for sure 
All right, we'll move to our um, last question that has been asked here. If anyone does have questions for our panelists, make sure to hurry up and get those submitted before uh, we end today's talk and head over for happy hour. Um, so the question I have here is if we could provide links to the playbook standards that Nick had mentioned earlier in today's discussion. Um, I can kind of jump in and answer that. We can definitely send some some links to those standards. Um, in our follow-up email, we will also be send, sending over some really great resources that we have put together. Um, you can also find them by using the, the little paperclip icon attachments. Um, we have included a ebook, Five Must Do's When Developing an Incident Response Plan. We've also included an incident response team and critical contact information worksheet and a incident response plan worksheet to help you build one if you do not have one already. Um, so go ahead and download those resources for future use. Um, if you don't get a chance to download them today or you're watching the recording, um, this will be sent to you in a follow-up email and can be also accessible through the US Signal website. All right, I think that is all of the questions that we have today. Um, so we will go ahead and, uh, and end the conversation here, but we will um, be at, um, again, Indianapolis Sun King Brewing from four to six today, as well as Founders Grand Rapids from four to six um, to continue the conversations there. And we look forward to seeing you if you're in our Detroit market um, tomorrow at Founder Brewing Detroit from four to six. We'll see you guys soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.